Good evening, everybody. How we doing? Welcome to Refuel. I don't know if y'all ready for what's coming tonight. Brian's gonna be preaching, so he's got something good for you, I promise. Well, hey, if you're outside, come inside. You're inside, you're already standing up. So if you ain't standing up, stand up. There you go. Well, Lord Jesus, we just come to you tonight, and we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, we thank you that everything we need, you've already provided according to your riches and glory. And we can rely on you no matter what happens on the outside, that we know that you are in us, working through us, and for our good. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace and brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Give of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are Faithful forever you will be Faithful you are And all your promises are yes and amen And all your promises are yes and amen I will 
was lost, but he brought me Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Is free Has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free is free. chosen, not forsaken, and I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me, and I am who you say I am, and I am, and I am. Amen. We thank God for our praise and worship team as well. You may be seated if you can. This evening's scripture will come from the book of Genesis, chapter 11, verses 5 through 9. Genesis 11, 5 through 9. Hallelujah. Are you thankful for the Lord our God? Amen. Yes. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, 
the people is one and they have all one language and this they began to do and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do go to let us go down and there confound their language and they may not understand one another's speech so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city therefore is the name of it called Babel because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth God we thank you for your holy word as you see in the scripture reading that they were all on one accord amen and there was nothing that could stop them but God that's what we need in this earth today we need women and men of faith all on one accord because nothing can stop us nothing can stop God's purpose when we're all together in unity amen be careful when division comes amongst the people because the thief comes to what kill and destroy that's what he's about that's why we need to come together in unity every man woman boy and girl in Christ so that the promises of God can be fulfilled amen someone needs us tonight to be on one accord they don't need us to see the body of believers fighting and complaining and bitter but they need us strong in our faith amen go ahead and stand to your feet as we prepare to bless the kingdom of God with our tithes and offerings God has been so good to us I know you might not feel like it but he has kept us from danger seen and unseen he has woken us up day after day to give us another chance to get it right and to help other people get it right as well amen God we give you the praise tonight and we thank you Lord for just your presence we thank you Lord God for what you're doing within us Lord God and within the body of believers Lord God we ask that you have your way tonight bless the anointed speaker tonight bless us Lord God bless these tithes and gifts and offerings that are about to be given unto you Lord we're asking Lord God that your hand be upon them in the name of Jesus we pray amen we have several ways that you can give amen you can text give FLCC to 77977 you can go online to flcconline.com and hit the giving tab or you can use your handy flcc app and give that way amen if you're here tonight we're going to start from this side first you may come for it this time we thank you in advance amen a question how many of y'all in the last month week whatever have heard a voice say just give up be honest well guess what that's not what we do <laughs> you are not alone there are believers around you and with you there are the people of God that pray for you every day and if you don't feel the strength of that prayer, then maybe you need to spend more time in your own personal prayer closet so that you're more sensitive to the move of God that happens 
Because God is all around. He's everywhere. He's within and without. And he simply says, there's no use giving up because you've already won. You can't give up a fight that's already been won. So I just want to encourage you tonight, if you feel like giving up, find a brother or sister that are believers. Somebody to pray with you and believe with you and be there with you because there's nothing like that brother or sister in Christ that come alongside you and give you strength every day. When you feel like you can't go on and somebody's got a word for you, it'll change everything in one instant. So if you're on an island and you're isolated and you just do your own thing, you need to maybe think about hooking up with somebody else who's a believer and a friend and holding each other in account and in encouragement because there's power in that. is new every day this so body gets tired but Lord you take me away and all of these things they will soon be gone And all of these things You know they won't last for long And that's why we never That's why we never give up That's why we never That's why we never give up. Oh, there's pressure all around me, but I am not broken. Even when I'm knocked down I just keep going Oh, and all of these things They will soon be gone Oh, and all of these things you know they won't last for long oh, And that's why we never That's why we never give up That's why we never That's why we never give up Pressing on and pressing on, and I just keep pressing on and pressing on and pressing on, and I just keep pressing on and pressing on and pressing on, and I just keep pressing on and pressing on and pressing on, and I just keep pressing on and pressing on and pressing on, and I just keep pressing on. Pressing on, pressing on, Lord, I just keep pressing on, pressing on, pressing on, and I just keep pressing on, and that's why we never, that's why we never give up.
That's why we never give up your love's why we never Lord your love's why we never give up your love's why we never your love's why we never give up oh, and that's why we never that's why we never give up oh, that's why we never that's why we never give up Perfect love It casts out fear And I am fearless As I draw near To If I don't make you feel good, I don't know what does. Oh, yeah. Who came here tonight to praise Jesus? Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, that's what we're going to do here. We're going to praise the little Jesus tonight. I mean, why not? Let's talk about Jesus. Yes. Well, uh, first of all, housekeeping, all the young'uns, the youth, you guys can be excused. Mr. Bobby's going to take you and uh, talk to you about some, some stuff that'll be really good, I'm sure. <laughs> all right. All right, all right. Were you guys excited tonight? I know I'm excited tonight. Anytime I get to come and preach or teach, man, I get excited. And I don't get to come a lot on Wednesdays because of my work schedule. But Pastor Shannon said, I'm going to be going down to the... Uh, to the men's thing early. If you want to have it, then, then go at it. So you got me tonight, and that's a good thing or a bad thing, but hopefully by the end of the service or the message, you'll think, well, that was a good thing. But uh, uh, let's, you know, I tell you, the world's got a lot of too much of everything, you know, but the one thing they don't have enough of is prayer. Let's start with prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord God, I just ask that you just speak through me tonight, Lord God. Lord God, it is not about me, but it is about you, Lord God. 
Lord God, I just ask that lives be changed tonight, Lord God. Lord God, may I be accurate, may I be motivating, but may I be encouraging, Lord God. And Lord God, I do pray for this nation, Lord God. Lord God, thank you. And it's in your name we pray in love. Amen. All right, just so, just so I know everybody's with me, something that we used to do, I don't even know if we've done it at this location, back when we were in Lowell, we used to do the Ric Flair woo. Y'all feel like it? I'm going to count of three. One, two, three. Woo! All right. Now everybody is awake, ready to go, ready to go. Well, listen, I'm going to start tonight with a story about a man I just read about myself. And uh, it's a pretty interesting story his life is. Um, it's about a man by the name of Bo Eason. Has anybody ever heard of Bo Eason? If you're a hardcore football player or a hardcore football fan, you may have heard of him. Uh, Bo Eason... At the age of nine years old, he had the dream to be the best safety in the world. Now, if you're wondering, what the heck's a safety? Well, safety is a defensive position, and basically they're the last line of defense. If you see a, a, the game being played, you'll see these two guys way back off the ball on the defensive side. Now, their job is to, to either guard the guy going for the long pass or to stop the runner if he gets past the line and the linebackers. He wanted to be a safety, even at nine years old. I don't know how he picked the, the position of being a safety, but at nine years old, he wrote a contract to himself saying that he would be the best safety in the world someday. And he still carries around that contract. It's all flimsy and falling apart, but he still carries it around. But if you're going to be the best safety, well, you've got to go and try out for a football team, right? So he shows up for football practice, and all of the coaches are there, and they're, they're measuring all the fellas out. They're measuring all the guys. You know, they're seeing how tall they are, how much they weigh. You know, they're seeing, uh, you know, maybe how long their arms are and all this stuff. When it gets up to Bo's turn, there's a problem. Bo's a little guy, real little. He stands about five foot nothing, and he weighs about a hundred and nothing. So he's little, and so when the coach is measuring him, they, they're like, son, I, I don't think football is for you. You're just too little. Maybe, maybe you need to go home and grow a little bit or something, but I just, I just don't think football is what you need to be doing. Well, this almost crushes his dream, but he has this dream. He's not going to let it die. And so he tells his dad, you know, he, he tells his dad what happened. And his dad said, son, did they measure your heart? Did they measure your heart? And that's what the night's message is called, the measure of your heart. The measure of your heart. The size of your heart. Now, see, his dad was a rancher. Bo's dad was a rancher, a cowboy. They had a farm with a lot of cattle and stuff. And uh, he began to tell Bo about how he picks his ranch dog. Now, if you've ever been on a farm or on a ranch, the ranch dog is probably the most important animal on the farm because he can do the work of about 10 men. He's keeping those cattle going where they're supposed to go, keeping them rounded up. If one gets loose, he can kind of run them back with the pack. But he keeps, he keeps the cattle going wherever they're supposed to go. It's an important job. It's an important dog. So the, the, the ranch dog has got to be a, a good dog. But he says, this is how I pick my ranch dog. Whenever, whenever my ranch dog has a litter of puppies, I go out there and I find the runt of the litter. And I tie a string to it so I, can, so I can keep an eye on it. And then 12 weeks will go by, and it's time they're big enough where they can sell the puppies. Well, he sells all the puppies, but he keeps that runt. Why would he keep the smallest animal, the smallest one? Because you see, from the beginning of that runt's life, he has to fight for everything he gets. If he wants to eat, he's got to fight for it. And he's little, but that don't mean he don't have to carry the same weight as the rest of the guys. He's got to learn how to run faster. He's got to learn how to be stronger. He's got to learn how to be smarter just to keep up with the rest of the puppies. So at the end of the 12 weeks, he's the smartest, he's the strongest, he's the fastest, and he's the hardest working dog of the litter. The runt becomes the leader. The runt is the one that he wants to get. You see, this, this, story, this story changed Bo Eason's life, and he lived a whole different way from then on out. But when I read this story, 
I think of somebody in the Bible. You may know a man named King David. King David was basically the run of the litter as well. King David was, was one of eight brothers. He was the youngest of the brothers. He was the little guy. And there came a time when, when they needed to pick a new king. And the prophet Samuel shows up at Jesse's house. Jesse is, uh, is David's dad. And he's like, listen, one of your boys is going to be king. So, so Jesse lines up all his boys, but he leaves David out in the field. He don't even bother to invite him to the lineup. And so Samuel looks up and down these men, and I'm sure these men look pretty good. I'm sure they were masculine, they were strong looking. Some of them probably smart, some of them maybe been good looking. But he couldn't find what he was looking for. And so he looked at Jesse and said, Hey, Jesse, do you got any other boys? I'm not seeing what I need to see. And Jesse's like, Well, I got that little old boy out there in the field watching the sheep and stuff. I, I just... I don't know if he's the one or little. And he said, well, let me go see him. So he goes out into the field, and he sees David, and he knows that's the one. That's the one that he gets anointed. That's the one that becomes king. Because, you see, he wasn't looking at the size of those men. He was looking at the size of their hearts. And David had the biggest heart. He knew David had what it took to be king. David, the, rent, the run of the litter, becomes the leader. You know, this is, how, this is how God, I think, looks at all of us and how God picks all of us. You know, I do believe that. I believe that uh, even today, you know, it's all throughout the Bible, and where I'm going to tell you, tell you about some of my favorite men of heart in the Bible, but, but even today, God looks at our hearts, and that's how he, he sees if he can use us or not. So have you measured your heart lately? What's it look like? You got any heart? Have you been using it? Let's go into the Bible a little bit here. My first point is the world may see you as unqualified, but God sees you as more than qualified. I said the world may see you as unqualified, but God sees you as unqualified. And, and if you look through, through, throughout the whole Bible, there's a lot of men, a lot of women that God used. And when you see them from the beginning, you're like, they probably weren't really qualified. You're like, why did he pick that person? But then by the end of their story, you find out they were more than qualified. They were the most qualified. Just, just to show you a few, one of my favorites, one of my favorites is, is Nehemiah. How many people know who Nehemiah is? Not too many. Nehemiah's got a whole book about him in the, in the uh, Old Testament. If you haven't read it, go check it out. Pretty awesome book. Nehemiah, when we first meet him, Nehemiah is basically a cupbearer. And a cupbearer is basically a butler or, or maybe a waitress or a waiter. Basically, it's an ordinary job. And then he's an ordinary man. Basically, what he does is he brings the food and the wine to the king. He walks in there and he sits it down. And he hangs out with the king, and then he takes it away. That's basically all he does. He's a waiter. But Nehemiah's got heart. He's actually got heart for something specific. He's got the heart for the people of Jerusalem. You see, earlier he takes a field trip to Jerusalem. This is the town that he's originally from. And he sees that his people are living in danger. The walls of the city are lying in ruins. They're just... You know, and the enemies can just come in and do whatever they want. Now, this hurts Nehemiah because he loves these people. You know, he's like, man, I, I, got, I got to do something. So he goes back to the king, and he, he asks the king, he talks the king in to letting him lead a construction project to rebuild that wall. And the king accepts his, uh, accepts his challenge, and he says, all right, you can do this. So Nehemiah becomes goes from being a butler to overseeing one of the largest construction projects of its time. Now, Nehemiah has a lot of challenges, but he makes it through. He never quits. He does what he has to do. He gets the job done. And he even does it in record time of only 52 days. These, these walls lied in ruins for years, but in 52 days, he gets that wall built back up. And those people that he loved are now safe again, and now they can live in peace. 
pretty awesome stuff. Another one of my favorites is Gideon. Anybody heard of Gideon? Gideon's a pretty cool guy. Another good story. It's in Judges, if you ever want to check that one out. Gideon, when we first meet him, Gideon, Gideon's basically a coward. He's hiding out in a wine cellar, and he's thrashing wheat. Now, we probably, I don't know of anybody that thrashes wheat by hand anymore. But basically, when you thrash wheat, you're trying to separate the good from the bad, the stuff you can eat from the bad you don't want to eat. And to be able to do this, you really need to be up at a high place with a lot of wind so you can kind of beat it out and the, and the bad goes away and the good stays in your hand. Well, he's in a cellar. He's in a basement somewhere trying to do this. That's the last place you want to do it, but he's hiding out. He's hiding from the people called the Midianites. You see, and these people are, are just going all crazy over the place. They're going in. They're stealing their crops. They're going in, tearing up stuff, you know, just, just making a mess of his, of his people and his land. But he's too scared to do anything about it. You know, he's like, I, I don't have much money. I don't have many resources. I don't have many people. You know, I don't have the smarts. I, I can't fight them. But God saw something in him. Even when Gideon didn't know he had heart, God said, you've got the heart to do this. And I think he looks at us a lot like that too, don't he? Even when we don't know that we have the heart, God knows we have that heart. Now, he had to push Gideon a little bit. He had to do a few things to prove that, that, that they were on board, that they were tight, that they were together. But when he pushed him, and when Gideon finally took his, took his challenge on, he went to face this army. And this army was an army of, of thousands. I, I couldn't find the number, the exact number. I've heard as much as a few thousand. I've heard as much as 30,000. But it was in the thousands, the number of the, uh, the army that he was facing. And so Nehemiah rounds, or, or Gideon rounds up everybody he can. And God's like, that's too many. He narrows it down to 300. 300 men. And he said, all right, go win this battle. So 300 plus God can beat anybody, right? And so that's what he does. Him and his 300 men, they wipe out these thousands of Midianites. And again... Just like Nehemiah, those people he loved, that land he loved, they're now safe, and they're now in peace. There's one other group of men I want to tell you about, and that's the disciples. The disciples, I think it would have been cool to be a disciple, you know. And, and I, love, I love the people that Jesus picked, because I think they look like me and you. You know, he didn't go, Jesus didn't go to the synagogues or the higher places of learning. You know, he didn't go to these fancy places and find these people there that were real educated or anything. He didn't do that. You know, he, he saw that those people, they just didn't have the heart. They didn't have the grit. They didn't have what it took. They'd been spending their whole lives pampered, you know, just reading books and stuff. He needed men that had that grit and had that drive and had that heart. Men that were working class men. And that's what he picked with the disciples. He picked people just like you and me. And man, I think that would have been kind of a, what I would call a motley crew. I bet those guys were, uh, were pretty gnarly looking. But the disciples, they're a lot like us. They're a lot like us. You know, just ordinary people. But they have heart. So again, I have to ask you, have you measured your heart lately? Do you have the heart the disciples had? The heart that maybe Gideon had? Or maybe you're like Gideon and you're like, no, I don't have that heart. I, I don't have a heart that God can use. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you do. Or maybe you're like Nehemiah and you're, you're, you're completely unqualified. But God can send you in that direction and actually make you the most qualified. Let me, let me let you know something, though. There's a reason he picked people with heart. It's because he knew they would put the work in. He, he didn't just, you know, pick a person because they had heart and just pave the way for them the rest, you know, make everything easy. No, these men had to work hard. These men had to put a lot of effort into getting the things done. He picked them for that, real, that very reason. He knew that they could do it. 
It's the same way with us. We got to be willing to work hard sometimes. We got to be willing to work with all of our heart. And that's my second point. My second point is put all your heart in it. Whatever you do, put all your heart in it. And in today's language, hard work makes the dream work. If you've got a dream, you're going to have to work for it. You know, a lot of times, uh, I, I've always said this. I've seen this written on a wall um, at a house. I was in Charlotte when I was a teenager. Somebody had written on the wall, you hold the key to your dreams, but you've got to wake up to turn it. So if you're a dreamer, you can be a dreamer, but, but wake up and start working. Make sure you're working hard toward it. But the Bible talks all about the good thing about working hard. Let's look at Colossians 3.23. See what that says. This, this kind of sounds a lot like what I just said. And, and I'm going to be reading from the NIV version. But it says, uh, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. Whatever you do, basically work with all of your heart as if you're working for the Lord and not for man. Because really, you're working for the Lord. Everything you do, you're doing for God. The message, the message version says this. It says, say, it says, not to do just enough to get by, but work from all your heart. He said, that's pretty good stuff, I think. Is that not good? You got to work with all your heart. I mean, it's right there. And, and it goes on. Look, let's look at Proverbs 13, 4. And this is from the uh, English Standard Version here. I, like, I just like the way it's worded. It says, the soul of a slugger. Now, slugger is not a word we use uh, too much now. But, but you can pretty much say lazy. And I've even seen some Bible translations call it idiots. We definitely don't want to be lazy or idiots. I think, I, I, for me, I, I just want to say lazy bones. So basically what he's saying, the soul of a lazy bone craves and gets nothing while the soul of a diligent is richly supplied. That goes right back to the dream thing I was just talking about. There, there's people, they, they want good things, they want success, they want to do something, but they're not willing to put the work in. They're not willing to put the work in because they're lazy probably. They're lazy bones. But if you're diligent, if you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to go at it day in and day out until you see the, the results that you want, then God will reward you. You know, one thing, I just it just popped in my head. I've got this theory called the uh, lick the spoon theory when it comes to working, when it comes to working for God. You see, we're all building a cake. We're all making a cake for God. Remember when you, your mom used to make a cake? She'd let you lick that spoon. You know, we're all building the cake for God, and really it's not about us ever. You know, we're putting the work in to glorify God. We're making the cake for Him. But God lets us lick the spoon. He lets us lick that spoon, and that spoon tastes pretty good. Yeah. That's just a bonus right there. All right. One more, uh, one more in Proverbs. Proverbs 6.6. 6. Again, this is from the NIV. It says, look at the ants. You slugger, you lazy bone. Consider its way and be wise. Look at the ants. I love that they use the ants because what is the ant? This goes right along with what we've been just talking about. The ants, the ants basically the runt of the animal kingdom, ain't it? Little old fella. We've got ant hills in our in our uh, yard, and they're as big as this pulpit. I mean, man, those ants, they can do some damage. Those ants, if you ever sit and watch an ant, or a group of ants, their guys are working all the time. They're always running around. They, I believe that they have the strength to pick up 10 times their own body weight. These guys work hard. And, and they, don't, they don't have nobody telling them what to do. They just, they, when they're born, they know what to do. They start making sure that they've got supplies for the winter. You know, they're, they're gathering up dirt, whatever they're gathering up. And they're building their, their, their underground tunnels and they're making these big mounds in the yard and stuff, but always working. The ants probably got one of the strongest work ethics of any animal. And it's, like, it's, it's the runt. But it's cool that God uses, uses the ant to explain some uh, way to work hard. But it's important to work hard. 
Now, now, a lot of times you may be saying, you, I don't have a gift to be a preacher or a teacher, but we all have a gift to do something. But did you know that the way that you work is your ministry? The way that you work is your ministry. Think about how you show up to work. Do you, do you show up just whenever you feel like it? You're 10 minutes late every day. You're, you're always complaining about this or that, or you're, you're just aggravated and mad all the time. You know, you, if you've got to do a little extra, you're like, man, this, this, this is terrible, man. I don't want to be here. You just got this, this bad attitude, you know? I, do y'all know people like that? I hope, I hope you're not that, kind, that person. But uh, I, I got guys that work with me that work harder to, to get out of work than if they would just do the job, you know? But people see that, especially if you're living out loud for Christ. If you're living out loud for Christ, people are watching you. And if they see you walking in the work, you know, in that sorry attitude, you know, always complaining about this or that, cutting corners, not doing the right thing, they remember that. You're an example for Christ. You're doing it for Christ. Even, you know, I, I, I move boxes for a living for FedEx, you know. I also train people there, but, but basically we just move boxes from here to there. It's, 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 anybody can do it. But I'm doing it for the Lord, you know. I'm not doing it for my boss, man. So I encourage you, be that person that, that's there on time every day. Even if everybody else is late. Be that person that never complains, that just does the job and does it right. You know, just show up and work hard. Get your 8 or 10 or 12 in and, and move on. But work as if you're working for God. Work as if God is your supervisor. You know? Jesus walk up on the dock where I'm at, I, I don't know what would happen. Man. I'd think half the guys would run and half of them would kneel down, maybe. I, but yeah, uh, Make sure, make sure that you're working hard. We, we, last week, or actually Monday, we, we celebrated Martin Luther King Day. And uh, I run across this quote, um, and I thought it was pretty cool. This is Martin Luther King uh, Jr. that said this. And this is about how the importance of working hard. It says, if it falls your lot to sweep streets in life, sweep streets like Mecca, Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the host of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. That's the attitude we need to have when we go to work. Our jobs may not be glamorous, but we can, we can do it the best. We can do our jobs so well that heaven and earth and, and everybody has to stop and say, that guy's good, you know? And then you can say, that guy's good because God's good, you know? Make sure that you work hard. There's a saying that I say, and I have to say it to myself all the time. I even got it tattooed on my arm. And the saying is, start strong, stay strong, finish strong. Whatever you do, start strong, stay strong, finish strong. And this brings me to point number three. Whatever you do, never, never, never give up. Never give up. Winston Churchill, do y'all know who Winston Churchill is? Winston Churchill knew a thing or two about wanting to give up. Let me tell you a little bit about this man. When he was a young man, he had this dream to be a politician, a high-level politician. And so he figured the fast-track way to be that politician was to go into the military. And so at an early age, he joins the military, he goes to the academy, he does all of that. And he actually does very well at the beginning of his career. He does some very heroic things down in South Africa, uh, breaks out of some prison camps and stuff, and, and he becomes somewhat famous. Uh, and, and he does so well that they promote him to a high-ranking officer at a very quick rate. 
And so his whole plan to become this politician is working perfect until the battle of Gallipoli. And you're probably saying, what's Gallipoli? During World War I, there was a battle against the Turkish army. And this battle, the whole battle was orchestrated, was, was planned, was, was thought about, was put together, and was even overseen, and he even led his soldiers into this battle. This, this whole battle of Gallipoli was Winston Churchill's idea. But the problem is it was a big failure. When they got there, the Turkish army was a lot tougher than they thought. And he ended up losing several men. Several men. Now, most people would have just quit at that. Most people would have just gave up. They actually, the army actually demoted him all the way back down to foot soldier. Just a basic carry-a-gun foot soldier. Most people would have quit, wouldn't they? But he did something different. He took that demotion as a new start. He's like, man... I got nothing to lose. Fresh start. I'm just going to start over. Sometimes that's what we got to do. We just got to take those lumps and say, hey, I ain't got nothing else to lose. I'm just going to start over. And that's what he did. He started over, and day in and day out, he worked. He worked trying to get back to that place he wanted to be. And I'm sure he used the pain from losing those men. I'm sure until his death, he used that pain from losing those men to motivate him. You see, a lot of times people want to want to say, you know, you got to squash pain, you got to squash fear, but sometimes you can use that. And that's what he did. He used it to motivate himself. And in 1940, he was named the prime minister, prime minister of England. And for y'all to know what prime minister basically the president of England, but uh, they call it prime minister. So not only was he a great uh, politician, but he was the top. He made it to the top. Pretty good. I want to talk about one more guy in the Bible. I gave you some of my favorites earlier, men of hearts, what I call them. But I want to tell you about one more, and that's the man named Job. Job. How many people know Job? Almost everybody knows Job. Job is probably the, the best definition of what it means to have a resilience. What it means to not quit no matter what happens. What it means to be loyal to God. You see, when we meet, when we meet Job, Job is wealthy. Job is one of the probably the wealthiest people in the world. It's funny, the Bible actually gives us exactly how wealthy he was. Check this out. Job had seven sons, three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 oxen, 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. Now, he's living a dream, right? He's living pretty large. But uh, then the devil or Satan steps into the picture. And uh, there's one day where the devil and the Satan are looking down, or the Satan and God are looking down, and he's like, you know, that guy, he's loyal to you only because of how rich and famed or rich and, and wealthy he is. You know, the devil says, I bet if you took all that away, he wouldn't be so loyal to you anymore. Now, of course, God knew better than that. Why? Because God knew the heart that uh, Job had. And so he allowed... Job to lose everything. He lost it all, really, in one day. If you read the story, I mean, before the first guy can report that something was lost, the next guy was coming in. He lost all of his kids. He lost all of his uh, livestock. He lost everything. But he stayed strong, and he stayed loyal to God. And so the devil thought, no, nah, I know what it needs. I know what we need to do here. He said, he's still loyal to you because he's got his help. And God said, no, I know better than that. And so, so God allows him to, to lose his health. He, we find him, he's got sores. The, some people call them boils. He's got sores all over his body. And these sores are so bad and so painful that we find him sitting in hot ashes. And he's got a piece of, of pottery and he's scraping his skin. 
That's how bad he feels. That's pretty, that's pretty miserable, I think. I mean, you don't want to sit in hot ashes and scrape yourself with some broken piece of pottery. Dude, that's, some, that's bad. <laughs> and if you read on about Job, Job, he, he gets close. He gets close to giving up. You know, he's got some buddies that come in and, and try to talk him out of it and try to talk him this way. His own wife comes in and says, why don't you just curse God and die? You know? And I guess about the closest he gets is he actually wishes he was never born. There's one part where he's like, God, I wish I was never born if I got to do this. But he never curses God. And he never loses the loyalty to God. And because of it, God blesses him and gives him back everything that he had two times. So he don't just have 7,000 sheep, he's got 14,000 sheep now. Twice. He, he double blesses him. All because he never gave up. Here's the reason that we don't give up. This is, this is what the Bible says. Let's look at Jeremiah 29 11. Or 20, yeah, 29 11. Jeremiah 29 11. Again, I'm going to read this from the NIV because I think it, it explains it exactly like I like. It said, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and future. That's why we don't give up. God's got plans for all of us. You know, he's got plans to see us prosper. He don't want us to live our lives in misery. He don't want us to live, you know, banged up and, and disgusted all the time. And a lot of times people live that way because they've given up. They've quit trying. They've just given up on life and they've just, you know, went ahead and let all this junk just sit on. But that's not the plan that God had for you. He says it right here in the Bible. He has plans for you to prosper. He has plans for you to do something. But you've got to be willing to work hard, and you've got to be willing to never quit. Never quit. We've got to have heart. Now, I want, to, I want to take you full circle here, back to the beginning. Remember, remember Bo Eason? Remember that dude? Bo Eason? The guy at the beginning that, that, was so, that was so inspired by the run of the litter story. Now you're probably like, well, what happened? You know, you said he changed his life. You said he, you know, he lived his whole life. Different. What happened? Well, this is what happened to Bo Eason. After his dad told him that story, he went to work. You see, Bo Eason would get up every morning at 5 a.m. And he would train. He would train because he had to be faster, he had to be stronger, he had to be smarter than anybody else that played the safety position. And so day in and day out, every morning, he worked and he worked and he worked. And yes, he did play football in junior high and high school, but he never was a standout player. You know, why? He just never did grow much. But he continued to work and work and work. He put the time in, he put the effort in. He showed up for practice. He showed up for games. And when it came time for him to graduate from high school, no colleges wanted him. There was no scholarships waiting for him. There wasn't even tryouts waiting for him. But he did find a college. It was the University of California in Davison. This was a college, for whatever reason, they didn't offer football scholarships. If you played for this team, you still paid your way to school. You know, you didn't get a scholarship to play at University of California in Davidson. I don't know if they offer them now, but back then they didn't. So basically, if you wanted to play on this football team, you just had to show up for practice, and uh, you might get to play. So that's exactly what Bo Eason does. 30 days before classes start, he shows up. And he, he gets a uniform, he gets, he gets a... He gets a locker, he gets the whole deal, and they let him go out and practice all day long. And he's, he's giving it all he's got. He's out there just working himself to death. And then at the end of practice, the coach calls him over. He says, come over here, son. And he thinks, man, he's going to give him some accolades. He thinks he's, he's going to say, man, this, you're doing good. 
But the coach says, son, I don't think football's for you. You're just too small. You're just too little. I, I, you're going to get hurt out here. Football is just not for you. So the best thing you can do is just go home, wait 30 days, and then come back when classes start. Because you, you can go to college here, but you can't play football here. But Bo Easton has a dream. So what does he do? He decides, no, I'm not going home. He ends up sleeping in his car for the next 30 days in the, the football parking lot. And every day he shows up for practice, as if nobody said anything. He shows up for practice, and the coach is like, man, you're not on the team. But there's this one coach, this one coach that can just see a glimpse of that heart that he's got. So he says, all right, come up here. He finds this old beat-up practice jersey. They don't look nobody else's jersey. It's different than everybody else. He said, here, put this on and go run around with them. For 30 days he does this. He shows up every day. He puts on that old practice uniform. And he, he gets out there and he, he, he does all the maneuvers. He does everything he can. For 30 days. And then the first game comes. The first game. Now he's not on the team officially. But what does he do? He just shows up. He shows up ready to play ball. You know. But there's no, there's, no room, there's no jersey for him, no team jersey, no, no game jersey. He's like, come on, coach, let me in the game. And that one coach, that one coach that had that seen that little bit of heart in him, he goes back in the back of the, uh, the locker and he finds an old game uniform that's, that's like a different color and everything. And he says, here, put this on and sit on the sideline. Don't move. Don't you move. You sit there and watch the game. And so he's sitting there, and he's noticing he's got a number two on his jersey. And he's watching the game, and he notices there's another guy that's got the right uniform with a number two on the jersey. He's like, okay, I've got a plan here. I've got a plan. There's a minute and a half left in this first game. And he, uh, he's like, I've got to get in this game. And so the team's getting ready to kick the ball off. And he runs over to the other number two. And he says, hey. Let's swap places, man. Let me, let me just at least run down the field for the kickoff. And the guy does it for him. So they're getting ready to kick the ball off. And Bo Easton slides in, and the other guy slides out. And he kicks the ball. And, and as soon as the ball is kicked, all of that fear, all of that adrenaline hits him. And he takes off down the field. Now that fear doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't keep him back. No, it moves him forward. He's running down the field so fast that he's the first one down the field. He's beating everybody on his team down the field. And he looks in front of him, and four defenders, big men, are coming straight for him. And the only thing he knows to do is close his eyes and jump. And he dives over all four of the defenders. And as he's coming down, his helmet crashes into the ball carrier's chest, stopping him cold. Tackle. Tackle. And the, the fans, they're like, man, they go crazy. And so Bo Easton stands up, and he goes crazy. He's like, I tackled him. And then he thinks, oh, Lord, I'm not supposed to be on this field. I'm not even supposed to be on this team. And so he says he put, takes his stuff up, and he, 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 leaves, he leaves very quickly. He don't even wait for the coaches to say anything to him. He gets out of there. And all weekend, he's worried about... Man, what am I going to do? They're going to run me out of that place when I try to show up Monday. Man, they're never going to let me nowhere near that, that stadium again. But what does he do? He shows up Monday just to see what's going to happen. He walks into the locker room expecting the coaches to run him off, and they let him walk on by. He makes it all the way to his locker just waiting for somebody to say, Hey, what are you doing here? But they let him walk right up to his locker. When he opens the door... There's a brand new team jersey in there. He makes the team. He makes the team. Four years later, he's a senior. He's the number one ranked safety in the nation. And he's, and he's drafted by the then Houston Oilers in the NFL draft in 1984. That's Bo Easton right there. Yeah. But you see, he, 
he had that dream. And it took years of work, did not? Now, one thing I will say that while he was in college, he hit a growth spurt. He's now like 6'3", 200 and something pounds. And even though his body caught up with him, if he wasn't putting all that work in year after year after year, then, then it would have mattered to nothing. He would have just been big. He wouldn't have had the talents. You see, finally, the size of his heart, his body caught up with the size of his heart. So, I think we can learn from this story. We can learn from Bo Eason. We can learn from Nehemiah, Gideon. We can learn from the disciples. The reason I picked this story is because I wanted to see that this stuff doesn't just happen in the Bible. When God sees somebody with heart, He's going to make things happen in them. Yeah, this stuff doesn't just happen back in the Bible. A lot of people say, oh, that was Bible times. So everything was different back then. No, it wasn't. No, it's not. It's the same now. God is still looking. He's looking at each and every one of us. And you may not think that you're qualified, but God sees you as more than qualified. Just take a minute to measure your heart. Have you been using it? You know, your heart's a muscle. And how, just like your bicep, your tricep, your pecs, whatever, if you want those things to get big and strong, you got to use them. You got, you got to use them. You got to put them under some strain sometimes. It's the same way with your heart. God wants to use your heart. But have you been using it yourself? Have you just been letting it lay dormant? What have you been doing with it? You know, David was a man after God's heart, so that tells me that God had a pretty big heart. And if we're made in God's image, then we've got a big heart too. It's up to us to use it. It's up to us to use it. You can't just, you know, think that God's going to pave the way. Be willing to use that heart. Let God work in you each and every day. Let Him work through you each and every day. Be willing to put the work in. Like I said, we may not have, our callings may not be glamorous. Our calling may be like that street sweeper. But whatever your calling is, do it with all of your heart, all of your might. Whatever it is. Because everything you do is a ministry to someone. You're, you're speaking and you're, you're God's messenger everywhere you walk. Whatever you do, whatever you put your hand to, you're putting it there for God. And people are seeing you. And they want, to, they want to grow. They want to learn. Be that good example for God. So I guess as the music plays, if, if you feel like you, you've let your heart grow dormant, small, then maybe you should pray about it. Maybe you want to sit at your seat. Maybe you want to come down and show that you mean business. But pray about it. Ask God to open your heart. Ask God to strengthen your heart. Ask God to, to do something mighty through you. When I look at this room, I see a, a group of potential people. You guys are ordinary people, just like me. But that's the exact type of person God wants to use. Ordinary, everyday people. He likes the underdog. He likes the one that's, you know, just, well, to the world, just not qualified you are qualified so I ask you today let God just use your heart open your heart strengthen your heart ask God to, to move away any barriers in your life ask God to give you the strength the strength to, to just go through any battle and do what you got to do to make it let God use your heart at the old church, we used to have a big cross that sat back here. That cross always reminds me of what God did 
what Jesus did. I didn't mention Jesus. Jesus probably had the biggest heart of all, right? They strung him up on that cross. And he did it because he had heart for us. He had more heart than we could ever have. And so I say, don't let that go in vain. Don't let what all God did just go in vain. Live with all your heart. I want to leave you with this quote. It says, almost anyone can accomplish almost anything as long as they're willing to work hard enough, long enough, and smart enough. Are you willing to do that? Who's willing to do that in here? Is that good? Y'all feel good tonight? All right. All right. You guys, y'all continue to pray. Do some business. Do some business with God. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to have Dewey come up. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you again. I thank you again for this opportunity, Lord God. Lord God, I ask that, that lives have been changed tonight, Lord God. Thank you for speaking through me, Lord God. Thank you for giving me the word, Lord God. Thank you for looking at my heart instead of, instead of my outside, Lord God. Lord God, I just ask that, that you allow me to, to let my heart grow and be used, Lord God. And I ask the same for each and every person in this room, Lord God. Lord God, that they measure their heart, Lord God, and that they see that, that they can do greater things, Lord God. Let them know that they are more than qualified, Lord God. Strengthen each and every one of them, Lord God. Lord God, just, just bless them, Lord God. Give them strength whenever they're ready to give up, Lord God. Don't let them give up. Lord God, give them strength so that they can work hard every day. Lord God, help them to, 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 be, to be like these men of the Bible. Lord God, if they need that push like Gideon, push them. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you do. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray in love. Amen. Give it up for uh, Minister Brian. Thank you, brother. We appreciate your, your dedication and your time. It's good to uh, see our ministers come behind our pulpit and preach the gospel. It lets us know that they're studying, they're keeping their heart in with the ministry and lined up with God. All these guys come up here and do a wonderful job, so we, we appreciate them. This church is full of good and blessed people. God has given a lot of men and women in, a, in our church talents. And I'm blessed to be surrounded by it. It's, it's a blessing to watch it. You know, to sit on this front row and watch people get up on this stage and to watch people pray for each other. Or if I'm viewing live stream and seeing what's going on in the church and hearing back feed on events and Monday night prayer and what people are doing for each other and phone calls and messages people share with me that people in this church are doing. It lets me know that you guys do have the heart of God. I'm proud to be a part of that with you guys. You guys are awesome. Hey, I just want to do uh, some quick calendar events, guys, and uh, we'll let you go. Don't forget about prayer every Monday. We do the Stronger Ministry on Tuesdays. Women, don't forget about the conference coming up this week, which is Friday, January 22nd at 7 p.m. and Saturday January 23rd at 11 a.m. And you can register at www.flcconline.com. F3 this month is Thursday, January 28th at 7 p.m. Don't forget the theme is Quarantine Classics. So bring your quarantine foods and let's eat and have a good time. Don't forget about Mom's Group Monday. Uh, I'm sorry, Mom's Group Meeting. It's Friday, January 29th at 6.30 p.m. The 2020 financial meeting is going down Sunday, January 31st at 6 p.m. Also, don't forget about the Fuel Students Ministry. We teach middle schoolers and high schoolers here on Wednesday nights. If you know somebody who fits that category and age range, bring them on and let them get fed. Also, do we have any first-time visitors tonight? Anybody? Is everybody family here? That's good. God bless you. Welcome, family. Right here? Oh, you are hiding. You are hiding. 
Welcome to Finish Line. You got to stand up, say your name, do a backwards flip. No, I'm just kidding. I was just going to pick on you because you were hiding. Last announcement, guys. I have uh, the ladies are going to meet up here at the front. Or really, it's for anybody who wants to come up front. They're going to pray over the men that are here tonight that are going on the men's retreat. So anyone who wants to meet up here after we dismiss. And if you're a man and you want going on the retreat, please make sure you have yourself up here as well so you can receive your prayer. We're going to pray for the ladies retreat. Well, something's bred wrong, bro. I'm just going off the notes. Um, I tell you what, let's just all come up here at the church and just pray over both retreats. How about that? God's going to move it both. Anyway, Lord, we thank you tonight, God, for everything that you're doing in the church. Even when we read the announcements wrong, Lord God, we still thank you anyway. God, I thank you for the heart of the people. I thank you for the pastor, Lord God, that is traveling down, Lord Jesus. I ask you to go with each and every one as they leave this building, Lord God. Fill their hearts, Lord God. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the anointing. We thank you for your precious love. We know that God is still sovereign to this day, Lord. We stand with you, Lord God, boldly. And Lord God, we be courageous with you on a daily day basis, Lord God. We will not fold and we will not give in to the enemy. For we know, Lord God, where we stand with you. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank you for the love and the protection you provide us. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Either come up for prayer or you can go home. Thank